Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Always good to have an introduction you wrote yourself. It helps. Uh, it's great to be back uh, presenting at LASCON. I always remember LASCON. It's where they put the interrogation light on the presenters. So if I look like I can't see you, it's because I can. Uh, yes, welcome to my talk about cloud and enterprise and the interaction of cloud and enterprise, basically. Uh, everything that I talk to you about is based upon my experiences uh, doing penetration testing. Um, so hopefully you will uh, get the benefit of seeing what we see with our clients when we look at their environments these days. Um, I've got so much to get through. I'm the kind of maniac that shows up for a 45 minute talk with 60 slides. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, a lot of them are pictures though, so um, hopefully it should be easy. Uh, this is what I want to go through. I'll do some really quick intros um, and then we'll talk and set the scene with regards to the types of cloud services uh, that exist. Um, we'll look at the most common cloud services environments that, that I see um, when I look at company profiles. Um, we'll talk about the uh, idea of cloud versus on-premises. Um, obviously, there's typically a lot of uh, opinion around that, um, pros and cons. Uh, we'll look, the main part of this will obviously be about the security concerns around the cloud environments, um, and I'll delve into lots of detail on that. And of course, I'll back that up with case studies from pen testing uh, and show you what we see uh, a lot. And then if we've got time and you're good enough, we'll do lessons learned at the end, just to round it off. Um, firstly, uh, you're probably all bored of this by now, but anyone in here a penetration tester for a living? Yeah? Used to be. Used to be. You, former, right? It's like the Marines, you never yeah, can't give it up. I was given a book by some of my friends, Python for Black Hats, yeah, yeah, I know, right? Exactly. Python, Ruby, or, you know, batch scripts, or bash, or whatever. Uh, cool. Um, okay, uh, who here is just then responsible for security in a company or an organization? Yeah? The rest of you, just follow me around the country. I like it. <laughs> okay, so a little bit about our company. Not many people have um, heard of NCC Group, funnily enough, uh, even though we've been doing this work for about 16 years. Uh, we have 1,200 employees in 24 offices worldwide. Uh, 200 of those are in the United States. Um, we have, actually have eight offices in the US now. We've added Toronto to the list. But I am based in Austin, the Austin office on 360. Um, so I love traffic, obviously. Um, <laughs> but we're all over the US. We're where our clients are, effectively. We obviously put our offices where our main client bases are. Um, if you've not heard of NCC Group, you may have heard of the companies that we acquired and amalgamated together in the US. Uh, NGS Software was the firm that I joined long, long, long time ago in the UK um, and moved to the US with. Um, ISEC Partners, Matasano, and Intrepidus Group are the three major firms that we uh, joined together in the US. And that's been a great experience because all of the people that we used to compete uh, against for projects were now all on the same team, so it's great. Um, so yeah, uh, NCC though, well, what do we do? We do a lot, we do everything. It's easier, to, uh, <laughs> it's easier to list what we don't do than what we do do, right? So um, we go for this total information assurance idea, um, but in, in security consulting alone, the, here are the types of things that we might get involved with on a daily basis, um, definitely out of my office. So all of the technology stacks you'd expect, all of the types of testing that you'd expect. Um, red teaming and incident response and forensics are my two main areas. So. Uh, different sides of the coin. Uh, a little bit about me. Yes, this isn't a very East Texas accent, right? I'm from somewhere else. That's my visa, not my mugshot. Um, I've been working for about 15 years uh, as an attack and penetration focused consultant. And in this very young business that we have, um, after you hit like the 10 year mark, they make you a VP or a director or something, right? So that's kind of uh, what's happened there. Um, I run the Austin office and I'm responsible for the Tola region, which we're obviously in. Um, I also run two development practices. Uh, one is called Strategic Infrastructure Security, which is predominantly to do with red teaming and pen testing, uh, all things to do with servers and buildings and people and hacking all of the above. And then the other side of the coin, I run the uh, North American arm of the instant response team for NCC Group. So I get to hack stuff and I get to see the results of when things get hacked by the real bad guys. It's pretty interesting work on both sides. Uh, if I was to pick a specialism, though, it's probably in the most aggressive form of pen testing that we now, I guess, collectively call red teaming, um, where you combine everything that realistically an attacker might do, physical, social engineering, you know, actual hacks as well, all together. Um, and that's great fun, as you can imagine. 
So, uh, cloud. <laughs> a lot of you guys might have seen similar things like this or rants from uh, ex-members of Oracle, perhaps, <laughs> on YouTube about cloud, right? Uh, there is no cloud. It's just other people's computers. Obviously an oversimplification, but is it? Because really that is what we're talking about. And when you're talking about the security profile of a, of, a, of a corporation and what they do with their data, this should be the thing that people think about the most. Um, but before we get into cloud bashing and all of the above, we'll just take a step back and look at why. What are the general deployment models that we might see when we work with a company that has some kind of footprint in the cloud environment? So the first one is uh, we use cloud services to support a product and a customer base. This is pretty common with people that make software, right? They use a cloud environment to develop that software or the uh, production data centers that service their client base using their software are in a cloud environment. They're not on premises. We use cloud services to support aspects of enterprise IT and our user base. So this is where you are offsetting parts of traditional IT um, that you used to have on-premises and you're putting them in a cloud service provider environment. Uh, Exchange 365, Office 365 are great examples of this, right? You're taking what you used to have on-premises and putting it in the cloud. We build cloud service platforms, software or systems. Yep, we work with those people as well. So the people that actually are responsible for the platforms that you put your um, data into, uh, we work with that side of the house. And then, of course, as is always with consultancy, you'll always have the for fourth one where we talk to a new client and they do something really new that we've never heard of before. And that's the beauty of being a consultant and why I've been doing it for so long. So usually, though, something like that. One of those is what we're talking about. OK, um, shamelessly stolen diagram from Wikipedia number one. Right. So this is the classic representation of a DMZ. This is what we typically think of the external profile of a firm to look like. Um, you know, you have your, your border uh, router on the outskirts, you have your outer edge firewall, your inner edge firewall. You have some environment where your DMZ services are, your web services, whatever they might be, FTP, whatever it is that you're standing up. And then you have, um, in the top left there, the blue side, you have your corporate network. Um, whose organization still looks like that? It's okay if it does, because there are plenty of... Uh, you know, industry verticals and what have you, that this is still the very traditional representation of what the outside of their company looks like. No, nobody thinks they still look like this? Interesting. Um, usually somebody tells me they, they do. Uh, but really, obviously, my point here is that with the way in which we architect our systems now, and specifically the way in which we use cloud service providers, not many people do look like this anymore. So this must be a very forward-looking room. It's fantastic. Uh, yeah, it looks completely different, right? Because we don't just have this DMZ with services in it. We have cloud and all sorts of things and partner links that screw all of this up. So um, let's take a look at just to kind of level set before we move on the types of cloud services that we should be familiar with from a category standpoint. Um, you guys will probably now be sick, sick to death of these types of acronyms with too many A's in the middle, right? We're talking about SAS and PaaS and IaaS. I guess, which I've never really been on board with. But um, so, <laughs> so let's have a look. Uh, software as a service, right? We, we now know this. This is ultimately, again, definition shamelessly stolen from Wikipedia because they're reasonable. Uh, software as a service is a software licensing and delivery model in which software is licensed on a subscription basis and is centrally hosted, sometimes referred to as on-demand software. Um, we all use this now. Um, we do. Um, these are some examples up here. Salesforce.com, Google Apps, Workday, Concur, Citrix, GoToMeeting, WebEx. This is all examples of software on demand that we access how? For a web browser, right? The most easy, ubiquitous thing that we have on every device. Everyone now knows and relies on things like software as a service. Um, platform as a service, slightly different, but smells really similar, right, at the end of the day. Um, this is where we're trying to do some kind of development or host something, and we need a platform to do that. And examples of cloud-based platforms are, as a service I have here as well. Things like AWS and Azure and Heroku and Force.com, Google App Engine, maybe some Apache uh, Stratus. Those are the types of things that in the development world you may be using to you know, host your middle, middle tier or whatever it might be. But that's the platform as a service idea. And then the uh, infrastructure as a service. This is the big one, right? This is the one where you, you build entire environments using cloud service technology. 
So the players in this space, there's some overlap, but we're talking about, again, AWS and Azure, um, Google Compute Engine, Rackspace Open Cloud, uh, IBM Smart Cloud, and, and there are more. Right? And this allows you to build entire networks, entire segments, stand-up servers, do whatever you want. Um, in this room, uh, I assume that some people will have been in one of these three categories in their company because cloud service technology adoption is on the rise. Um, let's do it real quick. So anyone here uh, at their company now use uh, like Exchange or Office 365 instead of traditional email? Yep, makes sense. It's on the rise. What about storage platforms like Box and Dropbox and Google Drive, right? Absolutely. So you guys all know what I'm talking about. And if you're in an engineering field or an IT operations field, you probably use this kind of thing as well, infrastructure as a service or IaaS. I don't know, maybe you're not supposed to say it that way. <laughs> oh, let's not forget though. Anyone that's sitting there really smug at the moment thinking, well, we don't do any of that. So this is not going to be relevant to me. Um, you probably do this dirty word, though, don't you? Citrix. Um, now, this is not a cloud service type, obviously. This is something that's hosted on, on premises. But I want an honorable, honorable mention to this Citrix presentation server. And I'm going to look at something uh, in the Pentest case studies section, because it's very similar in the way we hack it and what it gives us. So um, yeah, for nostalgic pen testers and uh, people that are feeling smug, if you have Citrix, then you may still have the same kinds of problems I'm going to talk about, especially if you have Citrix externally facing to allow people to do remote access or remote desktop or published apps. OK, um, most common cloud services. Asterix is to remind me to say disclaimer based on what I see. Um, you may have a load of others uh, that I don't know anything about at this point. But really, um, things like Exchange and Link and Office 365 are, are just hugely on the rise. Like most of the clients we work with now are either have either made the move to this, or they are in a pilot discovery phase, or they're considering it, you know, at some medium medium point. Um, the same is typically true for SharePoint. Who has their SharePoint in the cloud? Somebody will. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So when you when you talk to Microsoft about Office 365, usually you're talking to them as well about Yammer and SharePoint and some other things. Um, Google, Google Apps for Business, you know, the other side of the house, uh, the West Coast <laughs> companies, um, same kind of deal, right? Google Apps for Business. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, uh, Dropbox and Box are really the ones we see for storage, apart from like OneDrive, of course, and Google Drive. Um, and then other types of things, like collaboration servers, uh, services, like Slack and HipChat. People have probably used Slack and HipChat, right? It's kind of how you might communicate with your team members. And then, of course, underpinning it all, um, lots of companies are hosting parts of their infrastructure uh, in the infrastructure as a service world. So Windows Azure and AWS, we, it almost now is the situation where we're talking about this more than we're talking about on-premises, at least with the clients that we work with. Um, so good fun. Um, so why? Why are people making this kind of move? Uh, so if you Google for you know, pros and cons of cloud service deployment and what have you, you'll ultimately get to a similar sort of list as this. Um, this was from a list of 10 points that I found on Vario.com, but I realized that most of the points were repeating the same issue. So I kind of condensed this for us. Um, let's go through them uh, real, really quickly. So achieve economies of scale, increase volume, output, and productivity with fewer people. It's pretty, might be subjective, but that might be true. Um, Reduce spending on technology infrastructure. This is the big one, right? Reduce spending. That's why I reduced this from 10 to 6, because the other four were all talking about cost saving as well. So most of the time when, when companies are looking at this, it's all about reducing uh, sp uh, spending. Capital costs. No need to spend big money on hardware, software, software or licensing fees. Uh, globalize your workforce on the cheap. Um, well, yeah, we see that a lot, right? If, if you don't have to VPN into a central infrastructure to get to critical data or systems, then you have this ability to kind of all of a sudden not care where people work so much. Uh, so long as they have an internet connection and a web browser, they can probably get to what they need to do their job, so on and so forth. Uh, accessibility is what I covered. Less personal, uh, personnel training. Yeah, um, using a web browser is pretty intuitive, and we, we do it so much that uh, complicated clients for desktop software is starting to kind of drop off. Um, so pros, yeah, this is definitely uh, the type of thing that you hear people talk about. And when, you, when I talk to my clients, it's generally always about cost saving. 
which hopefully doesn't surprise anybody. But I can't end the talk there, obviously, because with pros there's cons, right? Uh, and that's what we want to talk about mainly today, uh, about the security concerns to do with cloud service environments and platforms. These are the four main areas that I could think of, um, and I'll expand on each, each one of these, of course. Um, the first is the actual security of the platform itself. Is AWS secure? That kind of idea. The platform itself is Heroku secure. Um, the second is the data. Is your data secure with your cloud service provider? And this is a bit of a difficult question and an interesting question that we'll delve into. The third one, I mentioned at the beginning that I um, was responsible for incident response. Well, incident response in the cloud has a, a very different feel to it or a slightly different flavor. So how much control and visibility do you have of your data and your systems if something really bad goes wrong? When we're talking about cloud services that you don't really own, you're just kind of leasing. So that's an interesting concern. And then the last one, cloud exposure of systems and data. What important data are you placing outside of your perimeter? And that's like really the main message around a lot of this. This is outside of your traditional perimeter, right? It's not behind your corporate VPN. Uh, it doesn't require me to have to go and plug in physically into your internal network and get to a certain segment. It's hanging out there in, in the cloud. So let's take a look at, at some of these in more detail. OK. Is the platform itself secure? Um, is the cloud service platform uh, being security tested to a comprehensive level itself? Uh, what could go wrong? Um, I've had the pleasure of working on the security of cloud service platforms in my career, and there are a few areas that it, that it can go wrong. Right? Um, it can be to do with the web application and the process by which you provision your resources, or it can be to do with the multi-tenanted nature of the environment. Um, are you in a truly private uh, environment, or are you actually sharing either on the same box or in the same network infrastructure? Um, it can be to do with the actual networking itself from a software-defined networking standpoint, how they've configured things, broadcast domains, VLANs, all of that kind of thing. Um, but in the main, what I found is it's not the last two. It's the web app. <laughs> so the bugs that we've, we've found when working with providers of cloud services have not been to do with the actual networking and the tenanted environments itself. It's been to do with the web app. And because that is the key to provisioning services, you, know, you have all sorts of really interesting bugs where you can spin up and destroy resources in another tenant's environment, all of that kind of thing. Not because they've messed up the networking, but because the controls around the web application itself not good enough, there were vulnerabilities we were able to get to other companies or other users' environments, for example. So all of these are really just examples of there can be vulnerabilities in the cloud service platform or the applications that control it, whether it be web apps or mobile apps or what have you, that could really put your systems and your data at risk. Data itself is quite an interesting one for us to think about. Um, what data are you going to put up in the cloud? Are you going to put your corporate email up there? Well, that's what obviously a lot of people are doing, right? We've mentioned before uh, Office 365, Exchange 365. Um, how sensitive is your corporate email? I mean, we use email for everything, don't we? We discuss new deals. We send passwords to each other. We do all sorts of things that we shouldn't. Well, no. Yeah. We use it for all sorts of reasons, uh, you know, employment reasons, security reasons, what have you. Um, when you put those emails uh, and take, or take those emails and from your organization and put them up into a cloud service provider environment, um, you now probably have a different problem, don't you? You have like a, a lack of control. Um, you have the ability for the cloud service provider to read those emails um, because they're in clear text in most cases. Um, it's a bit of a, a problem. And plenty of firms that we work with are worried about data compromise in the cloud. They're not so much worried about um, you know, one of these big providers going rogue and doing something with their data, but maybe they should, from a marketing standpoint at least. And, um, but they are worried about what happens if that cloud service platform gets hacked. All of my communications are up there, all of my corporate comps. You have a question? I was going to say, you know, you're talking about cloud data security, it's kind of interesting. I've been an enterprise security consultant for many, many years, and the last eight months I've gone and become a cloud you know, person. Oh, good. 
Uh, the one thing I've kind of noticed <coughs> is that uh, companies export their crappy security policies into the cloud and expect not to be exposed. Right. So, you know, I mean, to me, encrypting data at rest and in transit is just it, it, it's something that just comes naturally. Right. And I find it surprising that that it, it's it's not well, done in enterprises, and then they compound that problem by saying, "Well, gee, we're just going to move it into the cloud because it's more productive." Well, it's great, but well, the problem is that, and I'll, I'll go into the, onto this in a little bit, but the problem they have is encrypting the data in the cloud is one thing, but still having it in, in a usable form for the cloud service provider to perform operations on it is another. And that's where technologies like searchable encryption have come into play. And there are companies I'll mention later, uh, but Cypher Cloud and Voltive, those always spring to mind because they have a solution that lets you en encrypt your data before it leaves your premises and goes up to the cloud. But it's still in a format that the cloud service provider can use. It's still email, it's just the body is encrypted, for example. So that is an interesting dynamic and an interesting problem. But you're right, we should, uh, we should apply the same security policies and understanding that we have for our enterprise data into the data when it's in the cloud. Yeah, someone who does best practices, that would be a natural thing to, to look towards as yeah. a control. Say, well, gee, I can't do the same things in the enterprise, what can I do? Oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And the problem is it's not natively supported with a lot of these platforms, which is why, and I read my own mind, um, products like CypherCloud and Voltive that I've got at the bottom are products I have looked at. And that's how they, you know, they're third party, quite quick to market solutions that try to answer this problem. Uh, you have an appliance on your network that is effectively a gateway that holds the keys. The keys never leave your company. So all the encryption and decryption operation happens on that box. Um, but it happens in such a way that it's still a functional email with a header and all this good stuff. So it can be searched and used by Exchange and all that. So, yeah, um, it needs to happen. And uh, it happens not as much as it should, of course. Incident response. Well, um, anyone here, uh, DFIR people, first responders? You again? Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Well, then you'll know probably what I'm going to say, right? This can be uh, difficult sometimes. Um, you know, do you have adequate, adequate logging on these platforms for a start? You know, can you access those logs? What's the lead time in sourcing them? I've worked with some law enforcement at federal level, and they also complain about this, and it's really only subpoenas that actually change the situation um, in some cases. What form are they available in? Will they provide mon me uh, running memory snapshots for you? Well, you have a certain amount of things you can do yourself, right? But there are always going to be things that you do rely on the cloud service provider for. Um, can you easily get disk images? Um, is there any real-time telemetry? Well, usually, but it's usually you know, a service that's added on, so to speak. So when I talk to clients about their IR, and when we do IR readiness reviews and all that good stuff, when they talk about cloud, cloud environments, which obviously more and more is happening, I have to ask these questions with them. I have to say, right, how, let, do you have an IR response plan that, that looks at the limitations of, of the cloud when it comes to this kind of thing? Um, if they do, then we obviously have to test it and figure it out. Okay, um, the last one. How do, right, firstly, the cloud service environment, whatever it is, how it's accessed is of critical importance, right? How do the users access those services? How do the administrators access those services? And by that, I mean your admin staff that are making use of the cloud service platform. What does an attacker gain if they access a cloud service environment as the user? And what do they gain if they access it as the administrator? Should be fairly obvious, right? You, the user's data versus perhaps all the data or control of the data. Also though, what about the interconnection between the cloud environment and your corporate environment, the on-premises environment? This is an interesting one that sometimes is overlooked. Firstly, is there any connectivity? Most people, uh, certainly security architects, uh, when I talk to them and ask that question, they say no. And then they think and go, apart from this. So, you know, you have to ask that question, right? What is the connectivity from cloud to on-prem? If an attacker compromises a cloud host, are they able to traverse onto your internal network? Um, you might also be thinking, of course not, but it happens. Okay, I've got to speed up here. Um, so, case studies. Um, and these are, as I said, based from pen testing that we've done in the last 12 months. Um, some of it really recently. I'm going to talk about SharePoint, cloud storage, email uh, in the cloud. I'm going to talk about uh, attacking and controlling cloud data centers. I'm going to talk about um, sneaking into the corporate environment, like I said, uh, through domain trusts. Um, and then a good old fashioned Citrix hack if we have time for the nostalgic and the smug. Uh, <laughs> but first, 
Um, so how? Well, this isn't going to be a pen test 101, right? But what I wanted to say is that the techniques that I've been using as a penetration tester for 12, 13, 14, 15 years, whatever it's been, um, are still the same. Um, it's great. You only have to learn three things, and it's been awesome. So um, how do we break into these environments? Well, firstly, uh, password guessing. Believe it or not, password guessing. Single password guesses. So that means we only guess for one password, so we don't run into lockout, that kind of problem. Uh, targeted spear phishing with credential harvesting or C2. This is a big part of our red team and attacker model pen testing methodology. Um, and it makes sense because it allows me to harvest credentials from people and then access cloud environments as them and if they're administrators, as administrators. And social engineering. Yes, we call people. Um, that stuff that always seems so hokey to you in pen testing class, it absolutely works. Um, so these three techniques are really the main ways in which we would get access to your username and password. Um, examples. Uh, yeah, this is me doing a, a single password guess for the password welcome one with a capital W. <coughs> Anyone who thinks that's contrived has not done any pen testing. This is not contrived. Summer 2015 right now is the password you want to be trying, okay? With, with a capital S, with a capital S, sorry. So single password guesses, they work. They work because of a variety of reasons I won't go into, but they work. Spear phishing. Um, spear phishing has been great to add to our pen testing repertoire because it almost always works. Um, we'd be on pen tests where we can't get in via other means because patching's been good, config's been good, so on and so forth. What's not good? People. People, no good. So <laughs> ultimately, this is one that we use all the time, right? We, pretend, we, we, we go to great lengths to make it look convincing. I'm not talking about those broken Canadian pharmacy-looking emails that you get in your Google spam. I'm talking about like, well-crafted attacks. You know, we buy domains that look like your company's domain. We craft emails that are quite convincing. This is one I use all the time from IT support. You, 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 you hit my punchline. You hit my punchline. The reason this one works all the time is it's because it's to do with updating an asset register. And what does it say at the bottom? It says, you may be eligible for an upgrade. Everybody <laughs> wants an upgrade, right? Because their corporate machine is steam powered and they're like, Heck yeah, I want an upgrade. Yeah, yeah. exactly you will. So what do we attach to an email like this? Something like this. <laughs> this is an Excel spreadsheet with a macro enabled. It's disgusting uh, and gaudy colors because this is what IT departments do with Excel when they get hold of it. Okay, tr <laughs> trust me, a little bit of profiling at work here, but trust me. Uh, so um, sure, um, and you know, You'll notice, okay, it's macro enabled, there's a security warning. Microsoft took the step to protect us against macros, right? Sort of. Sort of. Um, and you have to click enable content, and nobody will do that, right? Unless you tell them, which is what this tells you. It says click enable macro, and it will automatically take your service tag and put it into the spreadsheet. How many, how many users do that? Pretty much all of them. Uh, oh, you know, yeah, it's, come on, like. You know, click enable content. That stops you having to look on the bottom of your laptop to see the service tag, right? Everyone's doing that. Um, so yeah, oh, it, we designed it so that it actually does take the service tag off the laptop. It's smart, you know, it's useful. But it also creates a backdoor on their machine and gives me full control. Bing! We designed an entire platform around this, right? <laughs> so I just sit there and wait for shells. Send all those emails, sit there and wait for shells. These are all machines uh, on a particular test that are under my control. Both Windows and Mac, we have different payloads. Uh, and then I have full control over them. I can see who they are. I'm now that person. Um, I can run a, a, a commands um, on their machine. And I can do things like invoke Mimi Cats in memory and just take their password out of memory. And now I have their username and password. Blah, blah, blah. That was a long winded way of saying I'm awesome. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Cross-contamination, it's a pain, but not for me. I get everything. Um, so that's phishing. Social engineering, well, yeah, social engineering works really well. Um, sometimes we have to make the expensive purchase of a high visibility vest or something, you know, to sell, to sell the, the scenario. But we can definitely start just to talk to people and get their credentials out of them. This does work. Anyone who tells you it doesn't, hasn't done it. Um, oh, OK, so what do we see the most? Well, Office 365. Um, this is the Office 365 logon portal, right? How do you uh, know if a company is using Office 365? Well, this portal will tell you. It's fantastic, right? Uh, you just try foo at and some domain name in the user, um, and then you, you hit tab, 
and then it will take you to that company's portal if they use Office 365. Done deal. If, it, if they don't, it'll give you an error message. Right? Random example, picking on Coca-Cola for no reason. Um, yes, they use Office 365. Um, you can do the same thing with Google App for Business. Right? When you go to Google App for Business to log in, uh, you see where it says enter your domain name here and go to email. That's what you do. Um, if you say so nccgroup.trust, that's our domain. We don't use it. So you get an error message. Right? Um, uh, somebody who does use it, UT, you get the login page. So pretty straightforward, very easy for us to figure out if a company uses a cloud service email. Um, SharePoint is also just as easy because of Google Docs, right? Because most, even like SharePoint login pages that have been configured massively like this to not really look like SharePoint, still usually have like something that says SharePoint in it somewhere. So you can obviously use search indexing to find out SharePoint. Um, cloud storage that's directly, uh, you know, with a domain, um, stuff like Dropbox, see this a lot. Um, it's a toss up between whether Box or Dropbox is more used on our tests, but obviously this is an example. Um, if you're able to get access to usernames and passwords for people and they use uh, Office 365 or Dropbox or what have you, like you get everything, right? This is me logging into somebody's account on a pen test. I now have everything. Um, I even have a link. I'm on IM as them. I'm in their inbox. I can send emails as them. I can see what um, uh, meeting they're going to next. I can cancel it if I want, all that good stuff. Um, so remember when we did all that uh, spear phishing before and we did it from the outside? Now we can do it from the inside. We can do it as this person, right? I can send that spreadsheet again as this person. So it doesn't have to come from some busted looking external domain or typo matched external domain. Or I can be really devious and I can just find a spreadsheet that they're already exchanging with each other for some reason. <laughs> put a macro in that, tell them there's a macro in it to use it. Um, so access to uh, email, straightforward. Um, also, uh, you get interesting stuff because you can do admin operations, right? Remember I said earlier, what about access as an admin? Well, uh, you just need the right permissions. So you have to target people really well. So when we do our targeting, uh, especially around spear phishing, if I'm trying to find somebody that like on LinkedIn says they're ex the exchange administrator for the company, they're receiving an email, right? They're receiving an asset update, <laughs> upgrade email from me. The reason is that if I can get their credentials and they've designed their environment in such a way, then it means that I can start to do interesting things. I can add mailbox permissions to another account as them. Um, Microsoft tells you how to do this. Lo and behold, you won't be surprised you use PowerShell, right? Um, this is me doing that. Uh, you probably can't see it, but this is me adding uh, the permissions of one mailbox to my mailbox and then in uh, OWA searching for that person and I have full access to their mailbox. The reason this is most significant though is that anyone who's done pen testing and has hacked exchange servers in their life know that it can be a bit of a pain. Uh, but the significant thing about this is where did I do this from? Uh, it was my hotel room, right? <laughs> I wasn't on their internal network because it's in the cloud, right? So all of this powerful stuff was possible with just a web browser in the cloud. Yeah? I'm sure you found, as I did when I first started managing Looking Exchange 2007, that PowerShell is in the best practice. Oh, absolutely. Like, uh, ultimately, the reason that we don't um, worry about antivirus anymore is because we write everything in PowerShell, right? Yep. Done deal. Sorry, AV vendors. Um, OK, bonus content. Um, Web single sign-on. Sometimes you have this kind of thing, right? Where if with one username and password, you get access to everything. This was off a recent pen test. I can't remember what this is called. One login. That's the product, one login. So we logged into one login as a bunch of users, and lo and behold, we have this platform to go to all of their different apps, and it's just passing the cookies through, and now I can get to Workday, I can get to Office 365. It's all good. So one username and password, their entire life. OK. Um, all of your cloud data centers belong to us. So one of the interesting things, so moving away from that kind of stuff a little bit and, and looking at the infrastructure as a service uh, realm is that because of the, I think, anyway, my theory is that because of the dynamic uh, nature of cloud environments that you can spin up and drop down servers really quickly and also this new thing that we're all talking about called DevOps, right, where you have your development team responsible for bringing up and down servers and all that good stuff, um, we've actually seen a dip in traditional infrastructure security. Um, just like the guy was saying about, like, wouldn't you just apply the same stuff that you you know you've known about for 25 years, and you'd apply that as a security policy? Ideally, you would. But 
what we're finding is that servers that are getting spun up and brought down are not patched well all the time. Now, stuff that was in that uh, DMZ environment, you can bet your bottom dollar that's patched well because everyone knows about, like, protect that outer perimeter. But this kind of rapid dynamic throw up and, and bring down of uh, resources, for whatever reason, it's not, uh, it's not being patched and configured the way it should be. They have holes. Recent example, uh, missing patches on a host, an internet-facing host that was a cloud service host. Um, and allowed us to compromise it as a system. It was a Windows box facing the internet with a misconfigured service. Traditional pen testing 101, we get on, we become system. Um, we found a domain admin token on that box for the domain that's running in the cloud environment. So this is all just pen test 101. Dump the SAM, compromise the cloud domain, brilliant. Uh, and there were multiple cloud uh, data centers, and that meant we could go between, between them. So this was just classic pen testing, but it's happening on the internet externally facing. Yeah. Yeah, um, so there's two, two things. Um, firstly, we are under the agreement with our client, but there is usually an obligation to notify the cloud service provider that testing's happening. Now, because of the pressure from their clients to allow pen testing to happen as a pretty standard practice, um, that's almost a blanket agreement. So, so yes, as part of our engagements, we do make sure they're aware that we're gonna do some stuff. That happens when it's this kind of thing, when it's servers, when it's Exchange 365 that I'm using a stolen password to access, no, it doesn't, doesn't really matter because it's just the client's data that we're accessing through their platform. But I'm assuming that domain admin is for, probably covered a lot of other companies. Uh, well, no, this was actually, this was a, a, pri a virtual private cloud, so this was actually specific to that firm. This was not the cloud services admin because that exists at a level above the hypervisor, right? So, um, but to that end, um, what happens when you do compromise cloud service environments uh, or cloud data centers, as we might call them, as domain admin? Well, you can possibly go to, between that and other uh, data centers that that client has set up because usually it's one domain, right? So you go from, you know, Australia to different zone, all that good stuff. Um, but then we also had this. Uh, we compromised the DC in the cloud. Once we were on the DC, we found that it actually had a trust to the internal domain controller in their internal network and a direct connection via IPsec. So we had this kind of situation where we compromised the cloud uh, environment and then we just traversed straight to the domain controller in the corporate enterprise environment. Double whammy. Yes, sir. Well, it's, it's both. It's absolutely both. The point that, yeah. Right. Yeah. The, you, you're, both, you're both right, basically, because it's exactly that. The, they've, people, the people have moved things outside of the perimeter and not considered what a big move that was. And then at the same time, they've not taken the enterprise security lessons they've learned over the last 25 years and applied it to the cloud environment. Well, and there's probably a certain amount of assumption that the cloud service provider is taking care of this for you. But the, the cloud service provider is not there to protect you against yourself. Not really. Yeah, it's okay. not going to harden your domain control. Right, right, exactly. It's not, they're not going to call you up and say, hey, you've got a domain trust. You may you maybe want to like, turn that, that off. That way, you're probably doing that on your own. That yep. Potentially. You just have a security problem, period. Yeah. That's, <laughs> Well, that should be the tagline for uh, all of my business cards. Uh, you just have a security problem, period. <laughs> okay, I am running out of time, but... Um, oh, yeah, for the smug. Right, so Citrix, yeah? Um, the reason I include Citrix in here is because the end result's pretty much the same. If you have an externally facing Citrix presentation server that you log in, your users log into with a username and password, you have the same problem. Because anyone who's done pen testing, in fact, you have a worse problem to a degree, because anyone who's done pen testing against Citrix know that if you get to this screen with published apps, then it's just like a few clicks to get to this screen, which is you running a shell on that Citrix server, which is where? Inside the corporate network, usually. Okay? So... Problem is the same. If I can get to this with we'll using the stolen username and password, then I can do some tricks and get to a shell running on that server. Um, I just put that in there for people that are like, we don't use the cloud.
<laughs> okay, I've got like five minutes, so I want to obviously do the lessons learned with you. Um, and by now, this should be screaming at you um, in a variety of directions. But the easiest entry points still definitely deliver, right, from a pen tester or attacker standpoint. Phishing, password guessing, social engineering. That's all we really need. That's all we really use on an on a extreme pen test, a red team pen test. Um, your general control of assets should, should be a worry for you because they're not really within your control in the way that they were previously. Your data security and your confidentiality of that data should also be a worry for you. The exposure of those systems, just like this gentleman said, like they're now outside of your control, outside of the perimeter, that should be a worry for you. Traversal paths into your company, that should be a worry for you from the cloud. And also, the main one, authentication and access control. How people access these. Let me go through these really, really quick. So, as I said, easiest entry points still deliver. Guess the passwords, fish the passwords, ask for the passwords, I don't care. If it's about usernames and passwords, I can get those passwords eventually, probably quite quickly. How much control of assets do you have? It really does vary, I guess. Depends on the SLA. It depends on the tiering you've paid for. It depends on whether you have a true virtual private cloud or you're in a shared cloud environment. All these different factors. Definitely a trade-off. You should use these considerations to decide which systems do you host in the cloud, which date, what data do you place in the cloud. I would argue that in the most kind of like uh, paranoid version of this, from a data standpoint, you should only put data up there you can afford to lose or not access again. Now, obviously, that's not your email. Sorry. Forensics and incident response. Now, this is definitely getting better, right? Things have definitely changed. Um, they, we do have, and we do routinely carry out investigations in the cloud. In fact, there's a lot of benefits to it in the way that we're able to quickly take snapshots or have the customer take snapshots, share them with our S3 bucket if it's Amazon, uh, spin up a, a cloud forensics uh, like investigation server attached to that image. We don't actually have to go out and do the you know right blocker acquisition of a bare metal disk, right? If it's like this, so there are definitely um, good good things here. When it comes to logging though, and what the cloud service provider itself is going to give to you during investigation, it can drastically vary. Um, some quick screenshots. Azure, if you've ever used Azure, it's pretty easy to do a capture of a running machine, right? The same is true with AWS. Take a snapshot, boom, easy. Move that to uh, your forensic investigator's environment and now they can work on it as a clean copy of that data. Data security, yes. Uh, email, great example, so is online storage. Uh, do you trust your cloud service provider? Um, do you trust their security? For a lot of people, their risk register stops with that question and they say, yeah, we do, and we've made that decision. And I'm not necessarily going to say that's wrong, but I can definitely tell you a lot of our clients, the answer to that question is no, we don't. So they're looking at this other problem. You know, perhaps only putting data in the cloud that you can either afford to lose or have exposed is one angle. Not a great angle, though, is it? Which is why these companies like Voltive and Cypher Cloud and other people on the market that are trying to make cloud encryption products are being so successful because it allows you to then make sure that the cloud service provider itself only ever has uh, crypt, only ever has encrypted data. Exposure of those systems. Definitely this should be a main, main theme you take away. Remember, where is your data? It used to be behind the VPN. If it's accessible via a CSP, then it's not behind your VPN. It's globally accessible outside of your company and outside of the boundaries that you traditionally had and trusted. How many layers of authentication are there between your data and the rest of the world? If your answer is a single username and password, you have a serious problem. Traversal paths, as I mentioned, fret model it differently. Not if, but when. Just take the stance, okay, all of our cloud service environments are compromised right now. What traversal path does that afford to the attacker into our corporate environment? That's the whiteboard exercise you start with. But it's the one that not many people are doing. So take it from me. You need to look at that. Just, just do that assumption and, and move on. Last but of course not least, authentication and access control. It should be screaming at you by now that usernames and passwords are not a good thing to use when it comes to this kind of vital data in a globally accessible environment. Multi-factor authentication is, of course, the terminology that we now use to replace the, just the something we know with the something we have as well, the token, the FOB. There are a few examples. Google Authenticator, if you, want, if you like uh, open 
source with no support. You have to handle that yourself. Companies like Doer Authenticator that are closed source, of course, but they have enterprise support, so they can help you roll out. Um, RSA tokens, don't laugh. They will still be useful for this uh, purpose, of course. Um, also consider other things like YubiKeys. Who uses YubiKeys for one-time passwords, right? So exactly. If I need to get into a certain system, I just have to touch a piece of hardware on my machine. That kind of idea. Um, if an attacker gets the credentials, the username and password, MFA will stop them getting past that easily. It won't stop them getting past it completely. Okay? Um, but by the way, a lot of people don't realize there is native support for multi-factor authentication available in a lot of these platforms already, like this. May of last year, Office 365 suddenly turned on the support for SMS-based uh, codes to be sent to your phone. This used to only be for administrators, and now it's for every user type in Exchange or Office 365. So we all have a cell phone, right? Having a code uh, texted to us is definitely a better additional step than just having a username and password. The same is true with Dropbox. You can just have a code uh, texted to your phone, SMS to your phone. It's not a silver bullet, though, of course. Pen testers are great at kind of figuring out ways to get around it. There'll always be other things. Um, something like this. Um, I broke into a system on a, on a site recently, and I found all of the Google Authenticator seeds. This means I can clone any Google Authenticator token that they use in their organization. This is the, effectively the cryptographic data behind that token. So securing this is another burden on the enterprise. I've had several pen tests where I've been able to get the seed data for not just Google Authenticator, but things like RSA soft tokens, by just stumbling upon an open file share that had them all in it. People are not realizing what they've got there, right? This shouldn't be stored on your network. This is really important stuff. Um, and also, from a phishing and coercion standpoint, when we go up against a firm that does have good MFA, um, we still create, you know, things that, are, that kind of fool them into working with us. So if you have, like, Google Authenticator backup codes, uh, or you have this whole uh, token thing going on and, and code thing going on, <laughs> I'm way ahead of you, don't I? Uh, then it's possible for me to throw up different kinds of pages that make it look like you're interacting with Google Authenticator, but you're actually giving me the token out of your pocket and I'm using it on your behalf. So there's always another trick up our sleeve. Man in the middle, man in the middle. exactly. It's the man in the middle. Um, that's it. I'm pretty much out of time. Uh, so I won't go through this in detail, but um, if any of you want to uh, get in contact with me, please do. This should work uh, by the magic of QR codes. Um, but thanks, guys. You've been really great. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.